Oke. Okay. You said why you read, why you wrote the book, but I want to know why you wrote it. Like a lot of people. Uh, read literature. No. A lot of people read literature. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. A lot of people read poetry, but not a lot of people write about literature or write about poetry or write a novel or a book or a poem or anything. Right? Here's someone like you who's obviously read a lot of uh, science and what made you write about it? Write a book especially. I mean, okay, you wanted to map the heavens. Fine, we got that. <laughs> what made you write a book? So, uh, okay, first of all, I'll give a silly answer. Like, it's a bit of a rash in my field, right? You know, everyone's writing about me. That's not why I wrote the book, but... This is what, you know, um, a lot of scientists are now actually um, feeling compelled, as I said, for social, political, cultural reasons to explicate science. So that was part of my motive. But to sort of say, sort of use a cliché term, right, when I consider myself a public intellectual who really engages um, with more than my personal ambition and my personal research area in my field. And so it's really started as a process. So I was um, always interested in the history of ideas. And I had started a PhD when I was younger, um, a second PhD uh, in history and philosophy, which I didn't complete, so don't get very impressed. I did not finish it. I, got, I fell in love with the science, so that's what I ended up doing. But I was always interested in sort of the history of ideas. And then I started writing um, for the New York Review of Books, which is basically, you know, they're supposedly book reviews, but they're actually essays, opinion essays. And that's when I realized that, you know, I do have a lot of interesting things that I do want to share. Um, and not just explicate the results of recent scientific discoveries, which, which I do too, but the process. So I was very interested in the process, and I felt that that was not being done enough by scientists who are active. The people who were writing about scientific results were often people who were not actively doing the science. No, but what I meant was I've read your book, it's a popular book, right? Yeah. It's not something meant for a journal or something. No. A lot of people might be thinking exactly like you, but would not feel that they have the power to deliver or have the prowess or even know the language well enough. Right. So did you feel that you were capable of delivering? I don't know, you've got to tell me, you've got to read the book and tell me. <laughs> no, you I must delivered. have been, you have to be proud to start doing something. Well, I think that, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I felt that I had something, I was, Were you was confident you'd be able to do it? Pardon? Would you, were you confident you'd be able to deliver? Oh, yeah. No, I knew that. You then, knew that? Yeah, I think that, you know, it was a compulsion to write the book. Okay. I felt that I needed to share, and I needed to write this. And it was, um, it was grueling. Um, as my family How long did it take you? That's a good question. So I don't know, there, there are many ways to answer it. So, you know, the book evolved. My concept of what I was going to write about kind of evolved. And ultimately, it was four months of working. Because, you know, the other thing about me is that if I don't do research and I'm not calculating, I'm not doing, I'm in a very bad mood. So in order to keep myself in a good mood, I had to work half the time on research and the other half of the day I would do writing. So were you in a good mood all the way through? Yes. Okay. I now, you, yeah, I, yeah, very I was going to ask you about that you, that the book is what they called Mapping the Heavens. Yeah. Right, but you also said that, not you also said, we now know that we actually know about 5% of the heavens, whereas 95% of the heavens, we have no idea. So basically we know Jack. So what are you mapping? It's like somebody from Mohenjo-daro saying, we don't know anything beyond the borders of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, but here's a map of the whole world. It doesn't work. No, but this is what is intriguing about dark matter. Although we don't know what the particle is, we can exquisitely map how it is distributed in the universe. And from detailed distribution, the idea is that we might get some clues to its nature. So, the interesting thing about these unseen entities is that we know the effect they exert in the cosmos. That's measured. Only gravitational. 
only gravitation. Yeah. We know that they uh, feel only gravitation. They don't couple to radiation. They don't, they don't absorb, reflect, or emit light. The only thing dark matter does is it deflects light. So That's we it. Know. We don't know anything else about it. No, no, but we have an entire theory. We haven't even found the particle. No, but finding the particle, we have not found, the only thing we haven't done is not find the particle. But what we do know is we have a scientific narrative of the origin of the universe from the Big Bang to today, in which dark matter is in the driving seat of the formation of all the galaxies and the entire sea universe. We would not have galaxies, we wouldn't be here if there was no dark matter. So we know that, so we have developed this framework. The only piece that's missing is the particle itself. And, you know, and I think we might find it any time now, you never know what science. Okay. Now, about this uh, Big Bang, it started off 13.8 billion or something years back, okay? And that's why everything is around here. But a lot of people also wonder, at least I wonder definitely, that what was there before the Big Bang? Now, I know, I've been told that that's a dumb question because there was time started with the Big Bang, space started with the Big Bang, matter, energy and everything started with the Big Bang. Maybe consciousness started the Big Bang. Who knows? So, at some point, you have to tell yourself that, hey, philosophers, you keep asking us, that you keep telling us, don't ask this question. This is a stupid question. But does it ever bother you to find out? Well, you know, I actually don't think any question is stupid. So there's that first. And the, uh, I think that, you know, I was using the case of Copernicus to make precisely this illustration. You're absolutely right. We know that the Big Bang, which is what we define as the origin of time and space, occurred 13.8 billion years ago. And we don't have the language to talk about what happened before the Big Bang. We have potential mathematical descriptions in string theory. So we happen to live in a universe that has four dimensions. So string theorists at the moment are trying to come up with a deeper understanding that can possibly answer the question, why this Big Bang and how this Big Bang? But at the moment, the current status is that they can collapse, they can generate universes that have 11 dimensions. Uh, sorry, what can collapse? They can create a universe that has 11 dimensions, yeah. collapse it to six dimensions, but they can't quite generate a four-dimensional universe yet. Okay? Yeah. So when, you know, when Copernicus came up with the reordering of the solar system, he could never have imagined that we would build satellites that would leave the solar system. So I think, you know, in the future, who knows, in another 100, 200 years... That's all right. Who knows be... is okay. I understand. No, 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 but we have concrete examples from history. No, I'm saying that... Uh, super strings, for instance, yeah. is not at all proven at all. It's just no, no, something it's, that people are working on, isn't it? Right, right. But the point is there will be a point of contact with observations and we have not, the theory has not reached that maturity yet where it's going to make contact with observational phenomena where it can be tested. And I think it's a question of just time. For no, but the other way that some people, obviously not everybody thinks super strings is the answer to the question because they have been other ways of solving it. Sometimes they say that, well, it's a kind of an oscillating universe. It goes up, it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down, like that. Other people have even theorized that, okay, this is just a, the, the uh, Big Bang, it's just a small bubble in a much bigger bang. Yeah. And these are little bangs going on all over, yeah. you know, maybe sort of a, a myriad universe, a complete multiverse. Infinite, infinite. Yeah. There could be infinite universes. Yeah. Yeah. It could be infinite also, yeah. which is not really very wrong, uh, different from steady state theory, which has been completely almost condemned, right? right. No, no, no. Steady state theory we have, so this is the idea that the universe is not expanding at all. So that has been ruled out completely, as are the models where the universe is just oscillating. So it is true that there is a peculiar fact about our universe that in order to describe the past, present, and future of our universe, we just need to know six numbers. And if those six numbers, these are numbers we can measure, like the expansion rate of the universe and so on. And if these numbers, the charge of the electron, etc., etc., and if these numbers were even slightly off, we wouldn't have this universe, we wouldn't be here to ask the Not question. Not just slightly off, but infinitesimally. Infinitesimally off, yeah. yeah. So the one solution to that conundrum, why this universe, 
is the idea that perhaps what you really have are an infinite number of universes out there. Each one of them has six combination of those six numbers. So you could have one universe somewhere, you have one that is not expanding, that's actually contracting. So you have one that's expanding but at a constant rate. So you could have an infinite number of them. In fact, because it's infinite, there's probably another universe where I'm interviewing Mokul on his book. Right? So, okay. <laughs> so, you know, an infinite number of universes are permitted, and so this theory is called the multiverse theory, which, you know, I find compelling, but I believe in it, and the operative word is believe. So we don't actually have evidence I for this theory. I'm beginning to think that people, not you, people who go in for the multiverse theory actually do it because those six constants yeah. Otherwise, make it sound very plausible that the universe has been designed for life. Now, to avoid that teleological complication, Absolutely. that there's a purpose to the universe, and therefore, maybe the big guy does exist somewhere. So, let's not, let's not get, get into that. Let's do a mul uh, multiple universes. Do you think there's anything in yeah, that yeah, reason? Absolutely. I mean, look, the, the question is the motivation for that idea obviously came from um, the circumventing the concept of agency for the universe yeah. and purpose for the universe. Right? But, you know, it's a perfectly legitimate scientific idea to pursue. Um, it's just that we don't have any observational tests for this. And, you know, I've been going on and on about how evidence and data, so we don't, we really don't even know what kind of evidence we could get to test this model at the moment. But, but this agency thing, sorry to interrupt you, but this agency thing, how are you personally, how do you feel about an agent? You're already smiling away. <laughs> yeah, okay, so the, the smile is because I'm trying to figure out whether should I declare. Okay, so I, um, I do not believe in an agent for the universe. Of course. Let's... Yeah, I don't believe in God. I'm, I'm an atheist. Um, and I don't think the universe, I don't think it's useful to talk about the universe having a purpose or not. Um, and, and I think that, I, but on the other hand, so there are many scientists who think that everything is knowable, right? I actually... Um, well, they thought of that in, in, in late 1890 when that Faraday or somebody, whoever it was, said everything about physics has been discovered. Already. Already. Yeah, and right. now we just have to clean up the little messes. Right, right. That's before relativity, before quantum mechanics. Oh, that's right. So, no, but I think that, you know, when I think about whether we will figure out, I've been telling you about the Big Bang or whatever. So there's a part of me, the humble part of me, that realizes there is no reason why this gelatinous mess in our skull, the size of a cantaloupe, why should we have the cognitive capacity as human beings to figure everything out in the universe, including ourselves and our brain, right? There's no reason to believe that. So, um, you know, I'm on the fence on this one. I mean, I think that Maybe not everything is knowable because of cognitive limitations. So that obviously have. that's what religions people also say, that God is not know. I'm sorry, I'm going on saying God instead of agency. <laughs> that's fine. No, I think that, um, you know, so, the, so I, maybe one, one thing that might be helpful is to kind of come clean on how I actually think about science and religion. I actually think that it is science and religion are not equivalent in any ways to how we make sense of the world or nature. That is not what religion is offering us. Science is offering us a framework to make sense of nature. And religions are about personal faith, personal belief. And you know, I know this might sound like a trivial example, and this is not to trivialize anyone who has faith, but I think religion is rather like a preference. So. I like the color orange, truth, uh, truthfully, I love the color orange, and Mukul might not like the color, color orange, and he might like blue might be his favorite color. There is no argument that I can provide that can persuade him to not like blue and like orange instead. It's a personal preference. Well, as I, as I was telling you, I'm colorblind. I, I, you just told me that. We had this discussion earlier, and he told me he was colorblind, so that would be, you know. Uh, maybe not much persuasion at all, right? <laughs> yeah. But, so I think, you know, religion belongs in the domain of the personal. And there are a lot of physicist colleagues of mine who have, uh, who talk about science versus religion. I just don't see them 
as uh, being on any kind of collision course. They are not actually, they are not competing explanations for the world. They are not on the same footing. Do you, in your everyday teaching, in your work, in your, with your colleagues, your interaction, do you ever generally talk about these things or do you just talk your work? We do talk a lot about, um, you know, why we believe what we believe because, you know, we are all in the job of persuading people to believe in our ideas, right? So this is something we do talk about. But I think there are very, it would be fair to say that there are very, very few physicists who uh, believe very strongly, have very strong religious beliefs. I mean, they may have some kind of spiritual belief, but there are, there's almost no one who would be like a literalist for any scripture, for example. Yet at the same time as we were talking earlier, there's the Templeton Foundation, yep. which wants to bring science and non-science, or let's say spirituality, into one fold. Right. And has the money and the deep pockets for it. So what are your feelings on that? Yes, yeah, so I think the Templeton Foundation is a very interesting foundation. So recently, because of the funding crunch for basic sciences uh, in the United States, the budgets of uh, the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health have been shrunk quite a lot. So the space has opened up for private philanthropists. And the Templeton Foundation has a huge amount of money. And I think their, their mission has been evolving. And so the current avatar for the Templeton Foundation is that they are interested in all sort of foundational ideas that would not get traditionally funded. So they've really moved away from this idea of trying to um, meld science and spirituality or whatever. They really are have taken a right turn. And the reason for that turn is because there's a lot more competition in the philanthropic funding space. So you now have Yuri Milner, who uh, is a billionaire who has um, donated money for basic science. Mark Zuckerberg and company have now opened up, um, they want to eradicate cancer, so they've started. So you know, all these philanthropists have now come into all the basic science questions. And so I think, you no, know, the Templetons have also moved along to be competitive with them. Oh, you, yes. Uh, there are four aspects to uh, the kind of subject that you've uh, addressed. One is religion, which uh, quite stiffly uh, demarcates uh, behavior and activity for eternity. Mm -hmm. And I think the major cause of conflict between uh, scientific communities in America vis-a-vis -vis India is that uh, any development against religion is frowned upon. So the more you start discovering uh, things which uh, will challenge say basic Western or Christian faith, the more hostile you will find in the, the society against you. Compared to that, imagination uh, is a complete variance with religion which is what uh, is now reflected in scientific fiction films. So we have reached a state in the last 100 or 150 years where people will actually imagine what science is going to do and science might follow them. And very interestingly, we have a, a, a well-known uh, science personality here who is an editor who is also in, directly involved with cinema. And we have his daughter who is... So a what's the question? Yeah. The question is how does science, religion, imagination, how will these three pack up against each other? I think you should answer that. Well, I mean, I think that um, religion doesn't quite fit, you know, I think I think slightly differently about this than you do. I think no, no, science I don't, and imagination... No, no, I don't at all, man. I don't. What I'm saying is religion prevents you. It says, this is eternal truth. All science yeah, is hogwash. What is prescribed no, but, you know, 5, the, the, years the, you know, so I don't want to spend too much time because this is a, a very specific to the American context, but if you look, for example, at the people who believe, there have been lots of studies, of the people who believe in, um, who don't believe in climate change and who don't believe in evolution, they are not people who are not scientifically literate. They are all scientific, a lot of them are scientifically literate. They understand evolution, they've studied it, but one of my colleagues, Dan Kehan, who runs this institute for the Institute for Cultural Cognition at Yale. So what he found is the disbelief of science, the yeah, evolution or climate change, whatever, falls along two axes, right? And that has to do with foundational beliefs, not religion, but foundational beliefs about social structure. So there are people who he broadly calls individualists, 
And these are the people who do not, who challenge climate change and evolution. The other kind of people are the collectivists. You know, in the U US, it kind of falls along Republican, Democrat lines, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it really has to do with world view, not so much as your religiosity. It has been politically exploited to lie along religious lines. And we've had sort of an evangelist Christian movement in the United States, which is again very politically uh, motivated. But I think we should carry this conversation offline. Yeah. We have another question. Okay, you. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. My question is uh, Will science further down the line be able to discover all the rules of nature? And subsequently, Will humans be able to modify nature and create and destroy nature? Well, we are already disrupting nature. We are cloning and with CASPER, um, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, -Cas we are manipulating genetic materials, switching them on and off. So it depends on what you mean by controlling nature. But, you know, I cannot predict the path of future science, as I said. But I think there's a lot of room for all kinds of major, major discoveries. Um, whether we, as I told you, my personal belief is I don't think we can understand necessarily. We may not be able to understand everything that there is to know. But there are many more laws and principles that we are likely to extract from nature. Yeah. Why don't you? Why don't you come up? And I have a question. Just one sec. Let him just ask me for a while. Yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Your comment on Levitt, you know, she was not recognized for Nobel Prize. That's not an isolated example. Sorry, my comment on Eddington. Levitt. 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 Yeah. My wife and I came to know Jocelyn Bell Barnett. Are you sorry? Jocelyn Bell Barnett. Yeah, Jocelyn Bell, of course. She discovered the pulse of Yeah, yeah. Radiance. Absolutely. I talk about that in my book. Yeah, so yeah. When, when Nobel Prize was given, her advisor got it. She didn't get yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote a piece on her and she told me that when she wanted to go to science, the college told her that she should go to cooking and other classes, not right. to science. And apparently, the push her, uh, pushed the college to accept her in science. Yeah, yeah. And the second question about your uh, religion, I'm not taking any side. But we are running a beautiful book called The Quaker Astronomy Reflects on God. I wonder if you read that. Sorry, what? I, I didn't catch the title. Quaker astronomer reflects on God. This is a personal history of how our faith affects our science. I see. That's also very important. Okay. What's your question? Uh, my question actually is this. Do you think sometimes we blindly worship Einstein because, for example... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, so this is a great question. So I think that... The, uh, the, you the, know, the reason I'm saying like Bosch Einstein equation, the recent physics Nobel Prize and erased it, Nobody ever mentioned Shotunanda Bokshin, and he was a professor at the University of Physics. So I think that she should have gotten some credit. I mean, he's dead now when the Nobel Prize is covered. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I think the, um, so the question, uh, to paraphrase his question is, why do we all idolize Einstein? So, you know, I'm really not one for hero worship. Uh, however, what Einstein did was quite profound and quite remarkable. It was a reconceptualizing of gravity in such a fundamental way that, you know, it's not surprising that everybody idolizes. As for whether fame um, in, in science and awards and rewards are just and fair, they're not. And I think what we're all trying to work on is to put pressure on the Nobel For example, the woman who discovered dark matter, her name is Vera Rubin, she's quite old, and she's not been recognized, and we've all been trying to push her. I think the only way out, as I mentioned, is there are now many other prizes. I think if the Nobel Prize Committee does not respond to the changes in how science is done, it is impossible to single out three people. You know, it's a limit of three people when science is done by a large collaboration. So my, you know, my sort of battle cry has been that, you know what, we just need to devalue the Nobel Prizes. If they're not going to change and respond, there are many other prizes, like the Breakthrough Prize, the Gruber Prize. All of these are actually awarded to the entire collaboration, to everybody who participated in the process. Uh, I don't think we have. Do we have time? So, Do you have uh, like few more? I don't mind answering a few. Hey, uh, I had a question. Hey, uh, so like this is something that has intrigued me for quite a while. So the universe, 
as we know it is made up of part matter and part antimatter but it all uh, human beings everything is made up of matter so yeah. do you think there is anything in the universe that exists here of what we know of or beyond that consists of purely antimatter yeah, so this is one of the unsolved problems in particle physics the the sort of asymmetry between matter and antimatter we don't actually know when and why that is set up but our universe definitely happens to be one which is dominated by matter and there appears to be no antimatter so where is the anti is there anything that you've talked about in your book regarding i have not talked about antimatter because we have no evidence for the existence of antimatter okay thank you